Hello and welcome to uh, Growth Marketing Day 2023. We're so happy to have you with us. And I'm looking so forward to this afternoon together with you all and our speakers. Before we uh, kick off, I can just briefly introduce myself. I'm Jacob Lovenbrand, and I'm the Managing Director of Bright Vision. And I'm hosting this event here today. But not only on my own, I have to my help Anna here as well. Anna. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Herman, and I'm a growth marketing manager here at Bright Vision. I'll be sidekicking this event today. And uh, among other things, I'll be managing the Q&A sessions with the speakers. Fantastic, Anna. I'm so stoked to get this going and uh, do it together. And we have a really nice lineup. And I'm sure you have read it if you have registered for this event. But we have four great speakers here today on really interesting topics for B2B growth marketing. We have Alexander Klupenko, who's from Bright Vision, Rand Fishking, Pedro Clevati, and Mats Verikop, who have uh, all kind of complementary views on growth and growth marketing from different perspectives. So I'm sure we will get a great session here together this afternoon. And we will present them more in detail later on. But Anna, uh, you yeah, have uh, thank you, Jacob. Uh, so I believe we have quite an international audience today. It would be great if you guys can type in the chat where you calling in from. We have quite a lot of Nordics, but I can see Hong Kong. Thank you. So, oh, I, I can see someone from uh, North Yorkshire. So uh, <laughs> that's fantastic to see. We have such a, uh, such a great coverage today. Fantastic. Yeah, a lot of uh, exciting places. And you're all most welcome to join us here today. We have Norway, we have Manila, we have Amsterdam, we have Switzerland. Finland and Helsinki and Sweden, of course, we're based in Sweden and uh, Cologne. Uh, so Germany is here as well. Yeah, Austria, fantastic, really cool. So moving on here and uh, <clears throat> before we kick off the first session here, you can see that Alexander is really eager to get going there. <laughs> Just one second about who is Bright Vision and the company who is hosting this event today. So, uh, as I said, I'm the managing director of Bright Vision, and we are a growth agency that works with revenue growth for B2B tech companies. And we help both large and small tech companies. We've been around for almost 25 years soon. Uh, we started in the late 90s, and we have been working with these kind of companies, but not only the big famous brand names within B2B tech, but also small niche players and so forth. So we can help uh, clients in all sizes, driving revenue by offering a full service suite of uh, services around demand generation, lead generation, strategy, inbound, outbound. We have inside sales teams, telemarketing teams. So we're covering pretty much the whole funnel or the whole bow tie funnel as uh, winning by design would say, uh, and uh, which we have had on our previous events, if you might remember that. So uh, with that, I can, and we also cover the Western parts of Europe, I would say. The Nordics, that's our hometown, so to say. And we have grown into the DAC region, the Benelux region, UK and France and Spain as well. So. If you have needs in any of these geographer, geographical areas, uh, you can reach out to Bright Vision and, and you know, say that you want to discuss something of revenue growth relations and so forth. And that's also a thing we typically do in our workshops that we have a few spots uh, for a free growth workshop. It could take a little bit different uh, approach depending on what interest uh, of topic you have to discuss, but 
if you're sitting there and wondering what should, what the heck should we do about this, or maybe we should have a second opinion on that or so, we're happy to help you. And we now offer uh, five <clears throat> growth workshops worth of uh, 1500 euros. So please uh, enter the QR code or click the link there if you have anything interest like that. Okay, Anna, I know you have prepared some warm up questions for us here, so take it away. Absolutely. So um, before we start, before we let uh, the first speaker onto the virtual stage, uh, we are going to do a little quiz um, where you, the audience, um, have a chance to win a prize. And the prize is our Bright Vision coffee thermos. So if you are the first person to answer each quiz question, uh, that thermos is uh, basically yours. So that's the thermos Jacob's showing it. The first one, what is the primary goal of A-B testing in growth marketing? Is it improving website user experience, increasing Instagram followers, identifying the best time to tweet, or enhancing email open rates? Who is the first person to type the right answer into the chat? So yes, we have, thank you so much. Um, oh my God, this is like so... <laughs> <laughs> so many people answering at the same time, but I do believe the first person, and I'm very sorry if I will mispronounce your name, is uh, Debanjan. So here we have it. The second one, which metric is most relevant for measuring the success of a referral marketing campaign? Is it click-through rate, impressions, website bounce rate, or customer acquisition cost? So um, again, <laughs> um, the Banjan, I'm, I'm very sorry. Like we cannot give you two thermoses, I think. So I think the prize for the second question will have to go to Ferran. Well, congratulations, both the and Ferran. Unless, uh, unless we can uh, do a special prize for people collecting thermoses with Brian. Yeah, Vision. exactly. I think the Banyan should have something more than. Uh... Just one thermos, though. <laughs> and we'll we do have a, a Swedish special. <laughs> Sorry. But you have another question there. I think there's a third price as well. We have the third one, and this one might be up for debate, but uh, we think there is one answer better than the others. Why did the growth marketer bring a ladder to work? To <laughs> Before I even started reading, I see good answers to climb the corporate ladder, to reach new heights in conversion rates, or to escape from endless email campaigns, or maybe to take growth hacking to a whole new level. And guys, again, because we are not hoarding thermoses, the price for this one, the price for this one goes to Chloe. Thank you so very much. Um, for <laughs> that was really, really competitive this time. But now I think it's time to introduce our first speaker for today. Right, Jacob? Right. Yes, it's time to go. And the first session, and we're so happy to present our first speaker here, uh, Alexander Kupenko, who is the paid media team lead here at Bright Vision. I've been with us for a few years now and have built up and developed a lot of our competency within the paid performance media section and um, have done that with uh, very good results which you will share a little bit with us uh, here today for about 20 minutes under the uh, the headline Sustainable Growth and Marketing Ecosystems for Paid Advertising. So with that further ado, please uh, welcome Alexander Krupenko. Take it away, Alex. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, I'm actually raring to go. So yeah, sorry for my impatience. Uh, but for today, I'd like to start first with some debunking some myths and misunderstandings of sustainable growth and the role of paid advertising in it. Uh, basically, a lot of people and a painful number of people that uh, I communicate with constantly and a lot of our colleagues and a lot of clients that we have equate paid advertising with growth as the main and the sole driver of growth, which is not correct. 
bad advertising is the fuel. It's not the engine. It can't be the engine in itself. It doesn't give you direction. It doesn't drive you anywhere. It just gives you a boost when you need it. So what gives you the direction? What gives you the engine to take you where you need to go? That's where the strategy comes in. That's where the ecosystem comes in. Uh, because the strategy first approach is a sensible and an obviously reasonable approach in that that you first decide on the direction where you should be going with your growth journey. And the engine of it, the ecosystem, all the tools, all the assets and all the stakeholders that you have drive you there. And then, and only then, you add the fuel to it. You add the advertising, you add the pay channels, you add the whole another layer, layer of strategy to it. And then you can start the journey. Without the direction and the engine, even with the most perfect ads, with the most beautiful paid media plan, you're getting nowhere. And this misconception leads to a lot of confusion among our colleagues on what's a paid strategy, what's a growth strategy. And uh, because of the pressure of the jobs, because of the myriad of uh, sources of information on it, they eventually miss the forest for the trees and they get stuck in tactics. They get stuck in improving CTRs and getting more traffic and getting more leads and anything, driving the numbers, crunching out the numbers instead of solving business problems. That's what growth should be doing. That's what marketing and paid strategy should be doing. So what does a good uh, growth strategy looks like? It answers a set of very obvious questions. Where are you going, basically? What will drive your growth? Do you have a product market fit and the necessary tools for your growth? Do you have the ecosystem that will support it? It uh, answers, do you have an understanding what will need to be sacrificed for growth? Because uh, you can't get anything without sacrificing something first. So you need to understand the cost of it. You need to understand how you will be measuring the results, how you would be measuring the progress that you're getting to those results and does the progress can be replicable and sustainable because a lot of growth hacking and a lot of growth marketing is focused on very short term, very aggressive um, capture of demand, which usually is a one hit wonder. You only can do it once and then you will spend two years getting nothing out of those systems, getting nothing out of those channels. And thus sustainability of it and replicability of it is not less important than uh, the growth rate overall. And when you have answers to those questions, it becomes much easier to develop a paid strategy, a paid channel strategy. So what does one find in a paid channel strategy? You will understand, it will give you an understanding on how paid will impact the growth, at which stages, at which uh, channels will have the biggest impact and at what time of your growth journey, how the performance of each paid channel and each campaign that you run will be measured in context of business goals and in context of uh, the growth strategy and how those results will be attributed. And attribution will take a whole another day to discuss, but it needs to be considered and included in both the growth strategy and the paid channel strategy as well. You will need to have plan B and plan C. You will need to have alternatives for when you need to pivot and adjust because you will be getting data and we'll get to it. And this data can tell you that the direction might have been wrong. So you will need to get uh, the alternatives. And that's where plan B and plan C comes in. And once again, same as with growth overall, you need to understand is your use of the paid channels and the channels that you've chosen sustainable? Will you exhaust it in three months and never come back to it again? Will you exhaust LinkedIn as a 
uh, as a channel. It's very possible and it's very easy to do. So once again, long-term sustainability needs to be considered. Otherwise, you're putting yourself into a corner. But another question would be, where do you get answers to those questions? And that's where everyone's favorite data is coming in. And a lot of time, data-driven means exactly nothing. It's a buzzword that in the last 10 years lots any meaning whatsoever. But circumstances are forcing us to reconsider it again. And sadly, we need to understand that there is only your data and there is all the answers you need in your data. All of the people who are present today, all of my colleagues and all of our clients at Red Vision sit on tons of consumer data from their customers, from their audiences, and they hold all the answers there. It shouldn't come externally. There is no magical numbers. There are no benchmarks. There is no golden standards on what your CTR should be. There is no golden standard of what your CPL should be. Only your own data will tell you what are your levels. And same with any methods and any practices in this, building the strategy, building the ecosystem, there is no ultimate guide for this. There is no uh, one panacea, one solution that will solve it for you once and for all. This usually leads to just uh, replacing your responsibility for it on a third person, replacing your data with someone else's experience. Usually, leads to very bad results. So uh, only your data is important right now and more so with uh, the increasing pri privacy regulations, with the limitations on data collection, with uh, the nearing death of third-party cookies, with the growing, rapidly growing popularity of ad blocking. Only first-party data, only the data that you have holds all the answers. and what could be a more efficient way to find them than ask your customers? And what could be quicker if they already provided you with all the answers? The problem here is what do you do with all of that? And this brings us back to the ecosystem. And it's a long, tricky process, starting with understanding the purpose and what is a marketing ecosystem. And to understand it, to understand the purpose of it, you need to uh, have uh, some introspection into what your business does and what's your goals for the marketing of it. So your ecosystem is dependent on what inputs you will need to provide into this and what outputs you expect to get out of them. And inputs can be anything from um, digital assets, stakeholder feedback, analytical data, it could be informa uh, contact information, it could be deals information that you have. It's any kind of input and outputs, obviously reporting, attribution once again, uh, performance results, everything that you're getting out of the system to drive new decisions. Then you need to understand what tools you need for those inputs and outputs and how those tools will communicate. And by Communicate, I mean all the integration and automation between different systems so that they're not working in isolation, siloed out and polluting the data, making it contradictory and unreliable. And then bad data leads to bad decisions. And last but not least, how scalable will the system be? And it's best explained with an example that for um, a 10 person startup might be tempted to go for the whole package of Salesforce products with all the bells and whistles it provides, but it would be obvious overkill. On the other hand, when you face 30% year on year growth and you're a hundred person company, Sticking with free Canva and free HubSpot is just unsustainable at all. So whatever ecosystem you build and whatever the tools you use, 
the whole journey needs to be planned out. The whole journey and the scale needs to be considered. Only then the system itself will be sustainable. And to build it takes time, obviously, starting from strategy and to identify all the tools, all the key components of it, stakeholders, channels, all the different uh, time periods and planning and scheduling that would go into it. It all need to be considered and part of the system. You need to consider what's the minimal number of tools you would need to cover the maximum number of needs and how easily they integrate between themselves. You will need time to set up the minimum viable ecosystem to start executing the strategy and gathering the new data that will lead you to step five, which is an endless cycle of iterations. How you right size, scale up and down your systems, your tools, you change them, you change their scope. Um, and it's an endless cycle. And it brings us to the most infuriating part of this journey and the most frustrating one. It takes a lot of time and anywhere from six months, probably to two years, if it's reasonable and everything goes uh, ideal, like in a perfect world. But we don't live in a, <clears throat> in a perfect world, so it really goes as uh, we planned and you need leads today and i mean literally today because it's the end of the quarter and probably all of us need leads uh, to report on the results today what do you do in that situation so you need to buy yourself time you need to get those short-term results somehow you need that growth immediately today and one of the most uh, demanding but uh, rewarding approach to this is to find the hero product or a hero service dependent on the company and the niche and push with it as much as you can to buy yourself time to develop the long-term sustainable ecosystem. And the hero product is demanding. It's not universally applicable. It's not a panacea once again for everyone. The product needs a validated product market fit. It should be the easiest, smoothest entry point into working and collaborating with your business while having space and flexibility for making it more complicated for retaining and selling those new customers. And taking this product and going into market to a warmed up high intent audience who are already in market for your solution or any solution of this kind and capturing the demand, the existing one will buy you time to build something more sustainable. On the other hand, we need to understand that this is short term. This is not replicable. This is not sustainable long term. It has its own obsolescence designed into the approach. And it only works if you have the other elements, the long-term ones, the engine being built and ready to replace it and pick up the speed and pick up uh, the performance when it comes to it. Because once again, only by having a good engine, having a good direction and having the right fuel at the right time will get you anywhere with marketing today. And I think that's all I had to say on this today but we have a couple minutes left for some questions and as you can see we have the qr code and on the screen and if you follow it you can get the uh 1500 euro worth of uh, growth marketing strategy workshop with me or one of my uh, growth strategists in bright vision thank you alexander thank you so much for sharing those insights and uh, really interesting to hear. Anna, you're hosting the Q&A session here. So what do we got for questions for uh, Alex? Absolutely. Alex, how do you measure the effectiveness of a marketing ecosystem is our first question today. Uh, if I had the rest of the day, I'd probably take it to answer that. <laughs> but uh ensured the effectiveness of the ecosystem would be in its own sustainability 
if you get if you can put all the inputs that you need into it and get the outputs that you expect and it informs your decisions correctly, that's that's a sign of an effective ecosystem. That's how you see that it's working when it helps you achieve the strategy and the strategic goals that you have. Um, the next one would be, how do you evaluate an onboard tools based on your business model for lead gen? I'd love to take the rest of the day once again for this question. It's a big loaded question, but um, once again, the obvious way to measure it, to measure their suitability would be uh, to onboard and test them, to use the tool, to use the system, try to implement it into your ecosystem. And if you see positive impact in revenue growth, in lowering of uh, customer acquisition costs, if you're going for leads, the CPLs should drop with this. So it raises the uh, efficiency and effectiveness of all your efforts. And it doesn't create new blockers. It doesn't silo you out. It doesn't silo out the data. Then you know it's working. Then you know you need to integrate it even more. Alex, despite not having the rest of the day, I think we have time for one more last question. And I hope this one uh, would uh, you would be able to, to answer uh, in, a, in, in a lesser time. Um, so uh, how do you keep up with the constant changes in advertising platforms and uh, the respective algorithms? Um, the obvious answer would be to follow Red Vision in our updates. So like and subscribe, as the kids say. Uh, but um, overall, there are a lot of influencers on the platform itself worth of following. It's sometimes as simple as reaching out uh, to someone like me on the platform and asking the questions on this to stay up to date with this. And that's why we are putting my email at the end of this presentation. So feel free to reach out and start the dialogue. Um, but uh, a less sexy answer to this would be to find the communities, to find people discussing the documentation of the platforms, to discuss in the nitty gritty of using them and becoming parts of those communities. That's usually where you hit gold and where you can follow the updates and not uh, be delayed and not be left on the side of the road in this journey. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Alex. There is some more questions left in the chat, but unfortunately, we will have to uh, stop here. Thank you very much for asking all of these wonderful questions to Alex. And thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. And I'm sure you can uh, continue answering uh, over email or so. If uh, you're interested, uh, you can easily find Alex contact details here. Okay, we're moving on to our next speaker, who is Rand Fishkin. <clears throat> and maybe you have heard the name Rand Fishkin before. Rand have made a name of himself as a founder of Moss, uh, as you know, maybe, you know, one of the absolute biggest and largest SEO software platforms uh, and, and so forth, and, and a pioneer in, in SEO especially, but have done a lot of different things within marketing and so forth. And it's now the CEO and co-founder of SparkToro and uh, continue to drive marketing software and insights around uh, uh, how to become better in your marketing process over there. And Rand will talk about the future of measurable marketing, since that's pretty much what he uh, <laughs> focus on every uh, every moment he have as a, as a, uh, in his working life now. So moving forward now, we would like to uh, uh, welcome Rand, who unfortunately got a very short uh, uh, schedule conflict, but he had recorded a really good message for us here and will take questions over email afterwards. So we'll have a little bit of other uh, setup on this uh, session, but I think it's just as good as well. So take it away, Rand. 
Howdy folks, I'm Rand Fishkin, co-founder and CEO of SparkToro. Today I'm gonna to be talking to you about the future of measurement and the future of measurable marketing. We are moving away from the world that we've known over the last 20 years of the internet, which has been focused on attribution, perfectly tracking people over time. And so I'm gonna get right into it because we have a lot to get through. The Growth Marketing Day folks will uh, make sure that this presentation is available to you. Let's kick off. All right, who are these four horsemen of the attribupocalypse? This is my portmanteau for the day. First off, third-party cookies going away. You may be familiar that Apple Safari has already phased them out. Firefox has. Next year, Google Chrome will be. Once that's gone, they're all gone. Uh, Anti-privacy, sorry, pro-privacy and anti-tracking laws are coming into place in places like Canada, uh, in California, which is propagating to the rest of the United States, and of course in the EU where it's already uh, very powerful with GDPR. Third, changes to analytics and ad tracking like what you're seeing in uh, GA4, right? The new Google Analytics um, and ad blocking technologies which have been around for a long time but are getting more and more adoption. And finally, big tech's embrace of what I'm calling zero click platforms coined by my colleague Amanda Natividad. You can see that there's a lot of uh, zero click everything. So I'm gonna talk you through these four in a little bit of depth and then we'll dive into how to move from attribution to measurement. So. Apple last year, <laughs> 2022, when Apple would like to track you, it's default opt-in. When anybody else, like let's say Facebook uh, or, or Instagram or pal about uh, wants to track you, it looks like this, ask the app not to track. And of course, most users choose ask app not to track and are happy to let Apple track by clicking that blue button. This is uh, of course, dark pattern UX, which is, which is totally shady. Apple should feel ashamed of themselves. But this change is already crushing Facebook and Instagram's ad targeting, right? You can see uh, YouTube set to lose 2.2 billion. Meta set to lose $12.8 billion from that, from that UX change, right? From Apple saying basically, we don't want anybody else to track because Apple wants the margins from being an ad business. I talked about Chrome phasing out cookies next year, which of course is happening. Once that happens, all cookies are essentially gone. All third-party cookies are done. Uh, the EU has made Google Analytics and a lot of analytics tracking, uh, especially through through cookies and browser-based browser sessions, uh, illegal, entirely illegal. So if you talk to lots of folks from Germany, France, Italy, right, they, they literally cannot use Google Analytics on their websites. And in a similar fashion, not exactly connected, but in a similar fashion, uh, Meta, and because of similar laws, Meta is facing the complete loss of all behavioral ad targeting in Europe. So this is essentially the EU saying, your whole business model doesn't fly here. You're not allowed to collect data on what people browse on the internet and then use that to serve ads to them across the web and on Facebook and Instagram. So what are ad tech vendors gonna do? Well. Uh, you can see proposals like Google's Flock, which has now changed to Fledge. There's actually been more written about it uh, this week as I'm recording this with, with the Department of Justice you know, suing Google. But essentially what Google is doing and, and Meta is almost certainly following Apple, Amazon, um, YouTube, all the rest of these, right, will use similar things, is essentially behavioral cohorts of groups of people. So instead of you, you know, Rand went and visited this sneaker website and so this shoe is gonna follow you around the web, Instead, they're saying, oh, many people like you have visited shoe websites, and so we think you belong in this sneaker category, and so we're gonna to topically classify this group of users, and then you, as an advertiser, can target people like that. Um, and this, this privacy sandbox has been going on for some time. I think it's, uh, it's actually about to get released. But essentially what's happening here is most web advertising is gonna get less personal to a single human and less directly trackable because it won't say this particular human being saw these ads and then experienced and visited these websites and then purchased from you. It'll instead say this many people from this group or this percent of people from this group took these actions. So let's move beyond ads, talk a little bit about uh, other things on the internet. Google obviously owns 92% plus of the uh, search market, which they're trying to argue in court right now to the United States government that they're, that's not a real market. It's the entire internet. Search isn't uh, a market by itself, um, which we all know is BS, but they, they're gonna try. Uh, and Google, of course, 
is ending, has been ending two thirds of all search sessions, right? When you perform a search in Google, two thirds of the time, Google actually successfully answers that query without you needing to click anything, which, which is kind of great as a consumer, right? I love being able to look up like, oh, how old is Edward Norton or, um, you know, whatever. What year did the Barbie movie come out? Or those kinds of things. And Google just tells me. I don't have to uh, click on anything. It saves me time, especially on mobile. It's it's kind of great. But as a content creator, it's horrible that Google is taking all the content that we created as marketers across the web, scraping it, repurposing it. Of course, as you can imagine, this is only going to get worse with AI. What we're going to see is certainly percent of clicks to ads rising because that's what Google wants us to click. That's where they will, they put those ads even above the instant answers. Percent of clicks on all organic other stuff, right? Our websites where we created the information that Google's harvesting, that's uh, going away. And of course, keyword data for it is hidden. And the percent of searchers who are gonna be satisfied by what Google presents them automatically, that is um, absolutely rising. So. These, uh, these new AI answers, you can see um, Google's presented some proposals of this. If you've tried the, the search generate or the generative search uh, AI interfaces, this is kind of what it looks like. It's essentially Google taking this data, right, comes from content you've created, you meaning all marketers across the web, and they're just aggregating it and then throwing it out there for, uh, for everybody. Pretty frustrating, to be honest. Uh, now, search has volume, right? There are billions of searches performed every day. It's one of the leading ways people reach websites, but social actually dominates our time online. And all of these platforms, Google, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Reddit, LinkedIn, TikTok, Pinterest, they all prioritize you spending time on their site. They don't want you leaving their website anymore. So, you know, 10 years ago, if you went to Facebook, you would see lots of links to the open web. If you went to Twitter five years ago, even three years ago, you'd see tons of links to the open web. When Elon uh, bought Twitter, he actually open sourced, right? He said he was gonna open source the algorithm so everybody could see. And you can see right in the algo that there's a penalty for including a link in a tweet. LinkedIn works the same, uh, Reddit works the same, Facebook works the same, right? They all wanna keep you on their site. And so they prioritize native content. That's why when you post content to those platforms that includes no link, it does better than if you include a link. Every network wants people not to click out. And if you've run some tests, uh, like the folks at Hootsuite or Matt Navarre, you can see uh, this in action. I I've tried it myself, right? I analyzed a bunch of my stuff. Here's one with a link. Here's one without a link. This is, uh, I believe I'm, I'm using Facebook here. And you can see that I get about 10 times the reach in terms of impressions. And uh, my engagement is massively higher, right? A, a little more than 10x on the one that does not include the link. Very frustrating. Even if you get that link, the referral string's missing. Look, this, this is why your numbers never add up. You're like, gosh, you know, I can see that my, whatever, tweet, LinkedIn post, uh, Facebook post, whatever, it's, it says it sent this much traffic, but then when I look at my referrer data inside my analytics platform, I don't see those visits. Where, where are they? Well, guess what, friends? This is called dark social. Uh, it's estimated between 30% 30 and 80% of all social referral traffic. So we at SparkToro uh, actually tried to figure this out because we were like, gosh, this is happening to us too. It can't be that people are bookmarking these long URLs. So we ran an experiment. We put, uh, we took all of these platforms, we put URLs that we could track where we could see every click from them in there. And we saw that 100% of all TikTok links in, in you know the link in bio, which is the only thing TikTok gives you, 100% hidden. All links in WhatsApp, hidden. Discord, hidden. Mastodon, hidden. Slack, hidden. All those private Slack communities that B2B SaaS uh, founders are always obsessed about, which they should be, but you can't track any of them. You won't see it. Facebook Messenger, 75%, weirdly. Instagram, 30%. LinkedIn, 14%, right? So they're removing a, a percent of all of these. Sometimes they pass the tracking URL, sometimes not. So I have a bunch of detail on here, um, and you can you can certainly check that out. But let's do a quick review, wrap up uh, the, this intro section. What happened here? Well, browsers realized they could use privacy for moat building, so they cut off all the third-party cookies and ad platforms, right? Saw the loss of persistent cookies, making it hard to take credit. And so they use these um, behavioral cohorts with view through 
conversions, right? So they're, they're taking credit for, in my opinion, probably what's gonna be more of your traffic even if they didn't actually influence those. Uh, Google search, right, which of course needs to show Wall Street growth, they are seeing, you know, you're seeing more ads, more instant answers, and less organic clicks, which has been happening for a long time, will certainly accelerate with generative AI. The social networks, wanted they, they wanted to increase their time on site, right, keep people on the platform, don't let anyone click out, and so they hide referrers when they do click out, and they build algorithms to make people stay. And the content networks, right, like YouTube and TikTok and Twitch, of course, with the loss of behavioral data from the rest of the web, they're trying to use content consumption patterns to target you through the ads. Okay. Well, I think I'm not always a fan of the New York Times, to be honest. Um, I think they do a lot of uh, mediocre reporting, a lot of like conservatives say it's raining outside. Liberals say it's dry and sunny. Why is that? Like, just tell me what the weather is, man. I don't, <laughs> why are you telling me what two sides of an issue are saying? But, but I actually thought this piece was quite good on why you're seeing so many bad digital marketing ads right now. Um, and I just want, I just want us to bring back great ads, you know, like this fantastic advertisement for, for, for business shorts. Uh, I believe this was an Australian um, ad, but you can see why this is happening, right? With the loss of all this data, a lot of advertisers who were previously filling up the ad spots are not there. And so you're seeing a lot of sketchy and strange stuff. So for marketers, what are our takeaways? First, organic attribution. If you are investing in organic forms of marketing, content, PR, social, SEO, I have terrible news attribution on that is going to be not just imperfect, it's basically gone for good. You cannot truly attribute uh, any particular sale. You, you can't use, how did you find us? And then say, oh, okay, they said Google, so we should attribute that to SEO. It doesn't work that way. You can't even um, use like, oh, we did a bunch of content marketing. We think that gave us you know this many impressions across that. You won't be able to track that over time. Two, many digital ads will remove direct attribution, right? What they won't say is this ad is responsible for this uh, you know, conversion. They'll instead say, we are going to imply a correlation between a group of people who saw this and the group of people who bought from you. That's not quite the attribution we're used to, but it's the attribution we're gonna get. I think what smart marketers inside smart organizations will have to do is move toward measurement over attribution. That's why this presentation is called the future of measurement because I believe marketing is going to have to move back, back to the way it used to be in the 20th century where we measure things, we see lift, but we will not be able to perfectly attribute every sale, every conversion, every email sign up the way we have the last 20 years. Okay, let, let's talk in depth about this. I, I wanna, make it really clear what measurement is versus what attribution is. So attribution is, you see this ad while scrolling Reddit, right? And then you visit the website, you reach a call to action, you complete that call to action, right? You take that actual action, and then that website sees in their referrals, Reddit was the thing that sent me the visitor that, and I can attribute you know, this is a super simple model, but I can attribute 100% of this conversion to my reddit.com ad. We all know this is not how it works. Almost certainly what happened is I probably have heard of this company before. I might have even Googled them before. Maybe I visited their website. I might be on their email newsletter list. I might have heard about them from friends. I saw the ad and was like, oh yeah, that's a good reminder. And then I went back to their site and that's what I ended up converting on. So the even in, even in the last 20 years of attribution where it was much easier to do, still imperfect. Measurement is different. Measurement is saying you run this ad on Reddit, right? Here's, here's HBO Max running an ad for The Last of Us, one of their TV shows, and they get stats about how many people saw it, hovered on it, clicked it, viewed it, and they can compare that maybe to other HBO series that they run ads for. These vanity metrics, right, which, which we've pejoratively turned them vanity metrics over the last 20 years, like that's measurement. That's what we can measure. What, what HBO Max will never be able to say is, oh, that ad for The Last of Us resulted in people coming directly to H HBO Max's website and then signing up, or if they already have a subscription with Max, staying with that subscription because this show is on there. 
They'll, they'll never be able to attribute that. They will be able to measure lift in retention, lift in engagement, lift in awareness, all those kinds of things. So here's, here's an example of this. I, I, I sort of like this as a story. So it's 1960 and Coca-Cola, one of the biggest advertisers in the United States, is spending millions of dollars on outdoor advertising like this billboard in Chicago. I think this is on Michigan Avenue, right? How did they decide to run that? Well, they looked at a whole bunch of things, right? They looked at the audience and potential reach and context and relevance of the ad and market comparables and lift-based lift -based measurement, right? Essentially what they said is how many people who saw that ad uh, might have taken some action. And to do that, they can't, you know, they're not going to follow people in their cars after they see it. They're going to look at same store sales and the lift in same store sales in a five mile radius around Michigan Avenue in Chicago in 1960. And then they're going to run the same billboard in Detroit and they're going to run the same billboard in Milwaukee and they're going to run the same billboard in Madison. And they're going to decide, did we actually see that lift in those places consistently within you know, some measurable band. And if we did, that's gonna be a nationwide campaign. That's how we're gonna to decide to invest. AKA vanity metrics. How many people drove past it? How did same store sales do in a region? Vanity metrics, right? It's, it's measurement, not attribution. So potential customer consumes content about your product. Here, here's a video game that I really like called Disco Elysium, right? And so I, you know, I, I learned about it on GameSpot. I, I saw some uh, reviews. I don't actually use TikTok. I think I saw it on Instagram or, or YouTube. But then, you know, people Google it. They, when I Google Disco Elysium, I get all the information I need right from the Google search result. I don't need to click anything. Google's telling me everything, right? The Metacritic score is right there. The GOG score is there. All the reviews. I can scroll through the uh, the critical thoughts on it. I can see what platforms it's supported. Like everything. It's all there. I, maybe, maybe I'll go to the Steam page for it. Sure. I might even click the Metacritic if I really want to dig in. But when I finally buy this game, there's only two things that the Disco Elysium folks do, can measure, right? One is... If they buy ads, they can see the view through conversion, right? Like, oh, this many people saw the ads and then eventually bought the game. But only if they only if they see those particular ads on that particular platform and they have their tracking. And last click attribution, right? Plus, <laughs> you don't even buy games on the game website. You buy it on Steam or on Xbox or on my Nintendo Switch, right? That's where I downloaded it. I downloaded it from Nintendo Switch. No measure, no, no attribution whatsoever, just measurability. So look, when I see you know people talking about their attribution models and how they're like, well, we have a sophisticated way of measuring how many people saw this, and then we you know bucket it out this way. The only way those attribution models work is if your analytics software can actually record all the visits that the device made and everything they experienced along the way. And this is never going to happen in a cookieless world. Never. Impossible. Google Analytics can't save you here, right? Like. Tons of people blocking, first of all, blocking GA with their um, ad blockers. And second off, uh, the, the, the systems that GA is using to measure will be blinded entirely by anything that blocks traffic or anything that doesn't happen on your site. So all the dark social stuff that we talked about, that's, that's gonna mess it up. Um, all the ad blocking, of course, uh, and the, the privacy laws, the fact that we're moving to a world without third-party cookies, like, forget about it, man. All right, so these MarTech vendors, right, they're trying to sell you on this AI and ML-based solutions, right? We're gonna use um, MMM uh, to, to the rescue to, to build attribution, uh, market, marketing mix modeling, where we essentially like predict which things you're investing in, have this kind of lift to you. And it only works if every single brand touch is definitely included. And that is such a lie. The only way this really works, the place where this really works is big, big advertisers with huge marketing budgets who uh, in those marketing spends require, you know, sort of this, this attribution and tracking. If we're talking about, you know, people who are spending $100 million plus a month or a quarter on ads, okay. MMM, pro probably pretty good. Otherwise, econometrics models completely fall apart. For most small and medium businesses, is, this is just a waste entirely. But let me just tell you, here's a bunch of things that you cannot measure, <laughs> cannot measure with MMM, not to mention all the things you could potentially, conceivably, I could imagine a way where it's possible. But you know what? To be honest, no one's ever going to set these up.
No one ever is gonna set these up. I don't care how big your brand is. You're not gonna start tracking all your streamer reviews and your comment marketing, your organic content, your customer support mark. No, uh-uh. And put that into your econometrics. Get out of here, come on. Maybe two of those, maybe one. <laughs> so the hard to swallow pill here, friends, is that often the best marketing opportunities are the least measurable. I know, I know, it's tough. It's a rough world. So if I'm clay.com, right, I'm, I'm that website that was advertising on Reddit. Instead of running ads and trying to attribute everything, I might instead think backwards and go, where are my customers? Think like uh, uh, Coca-Cola did with Michigan Avenue in 1960. Where are my customers? Where's my audience? Huh, well, it turns out they listen to these podcasts. Well, heck yeah, let's go sponsor those podcasts. Let's go get on those podcasts. Let's go pitch them. Maybe we can do something with them. That sounds that sounds great. <laughs> Here's the problem. Have you ever tried? Have you ever tried to pick, pitch your boss or your client, your team for a mar you know, as a marketer? Hey, 37% of our target audience engages with this podcast. Let, let's go do something with them. Co-marketing with a podcast. How are we gonna prove attribution? Hell no. <laughs> Versus, hey boss. The model says all we need to do is put another uh, $5 million into Google Ads to get $5.01 million of sales. Put it on the company card, baby. <laughs> I mean, hey, this is just this is just how life is as a marketer, right? It, it, just spend more on ads, right? Turns out when a lot of big companies very savvily spent a lot more money on their ads, they did not see improved results. And when they cut that spend, like Chase did, Procter & Gamble, Uber, Airbnb, eBay. What did they see? <laughs> what did they see? They saw their metrics go up because the ads weren't doing anything. They were just taking credit for sales that were already gonna happen. So I'm saying marketing measurement is dead? Well, look, it's not dead. You can measure things, right? I can measure awareness through things like um, impressions on social, right? I look at my LinkedIn impressions. I track that week over week. I can see whether more and more people are seeing my stuff. I could measure interest in my brand or in the products that I'm offering through search volume. You know, see how many people are Googling something. Google ads can help with this, Google trends. You could use um, clickstream data providers. I, I can look at visits, right? I can see how many visits am I getting from direct, which I know are not direct. They're almost certainly from other places but I can see that lift as I engage in activities. And I can see familiarity, right? Growth and familiarity with my brand through surveys, through overall traffic, through click-through rate, through conversion rate, because the more familiar people are with my brand, the more likely they are for, to buy from me. So, you know, we, we can do this, right? Like here's SparkToro. This is, this is my, you know, my software company, right? And, and we're looking at our metrics. We're seeing almost everything's direct and branded. So I, I built one of these. I built one of these sort of impossible to measure dashboard, right? Where I'm looking at brand interest, social engagement, website traffic, subscribed audience, conversions. You, you can check this out on the blog if you want. You can even copy it if you'd like. A few software companies uh, like the folks at BrandOps are building dashboards like this to try and help with the measurement over attribution problem. But you're gonna hate this part. Oh, you're gonna hate it so much. I'm so sorry. We reject not only attribution at SparkToro, but most measurement too. We, we just don't even bother. Why? Because properly testing and measuring, like to set all that stuff up, track it regularly, it's such a huge time sink and investment for us that we believe it's more wasteful than just getting some marketing wrong. Just put it, you know, the equivalent of buying a few billboards on the wrong street in Chicago instead of the right one. It's fine. We, we don't mind, I don't mind being in a few of the wrong places as long as I'm in most of the right places. And to be honest, um, if you've got good instincts and good intuition, this works. This, this is kind of how we do things at SparkToro. We look for building a flywheel, right? Something we can engage with over and over again, find a source that reaches our audience, provide unique value that earns their attention, hopefully wow that audience, and then bring them to our site and turn that publications, that source of influences audience into our audience. This, you know, sort of placement in a marketing niche newsletter or, uh, you know, looking, looking at our, our social media stats, finding shared value between our brand. We, we ask this question all the time. We have a source of influence, X, that we want to amplify my brand. Well, what could we do with X that would get them to engage with us, that would earn us that coverage? Newsworthy things, I'd be a guest on their podcast, I could be 
one of their webinar speakers. I'm getting a little meta. Uh, sponsor their email newsletter, maybe write some research that they would publish, run a joint survey together, get quoted in one of their articles, a million different things. You can imagine this, this you know, these blue boxes go on to infinity. We, we really don't use paid media. We don't use SEO. We find our audience's sources of influence and then we're present there. And that's how we've grown uh, over the last three and a half years. So I ask the questions, are my customers engaged on this platform? Do I like participating here? Is it playing to my strengths? Are my vanity, the vanity metrics improving, you know, followers and impressions and direct traffic and uh, interest? And look, in 2023 and beyond, I think this, it, this is what marketers have to choose from. Number one, you can keep throwing money at big tech. Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, they are happy to take your money and they will provide you with what they say is attribution. And you will never know if it's real unless you cut it off. Second, you can build those hard to measure dashboards. If you have a sophisticated marketing team and process, you, you could certainly invest in that. And you can use those 20th, style, 20th century style marketing tactics you know, measurement tactics to invest and to choose where to put your dollars. Or you can be like SparkToro. You can measure the big stuff, traffic, conversions, revenue, and ignore almost everything else and make investments based on your theories and your gut and be wrong sometimes and be okay with that because even the wrong investments you make will most likely save you more time than doing all the work of number two or certainly spending the money of number one. Almost every company is gonna do this that's why it's not a competitive advantage, friends. All right, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, I will, I'm available uh, for, to take some questions. And I know that uh, Emma and the growth marketing folks have, have said they'll reach out to me. So if you have some questions, feel free to send them over and uh, I'll do my best to answer those. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay, that was Ran Fishkin, who was the co-founder and CEO of SparkToro, previously in Moss. And I think he shared a lot of great insights here around attribution and measurement. So yeah, hard pills to swallow, Anna. So um, any questions from your side that we should email to uh, Rand? Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> we do have questions in the chat and um, some of them include like how uh, can companies more effectively measure or understand uh, this mythical dark social traffic? What are some tools or methods uh, Rand would recommend? So that's one that we are certainly going to forward to him. Um, also, uh, Ashley is asking, given the trends uh, you've discussed, what would be your top advice for marketers looking to future-proof their measurement strategies in 2024 and beyond? So all of these are very interesting and we will make sure they will reach around and uh, we'll do our best uh, to prompt him uh, to reply to those very, very quickly, as he promised. Absolutely. And we can post them on our LinkedIn profile or something like that as well. So we make sure it comes to everybody's uh, knowledge when we have um, more content on this. So great. Awesome. Well, it's time for the next speaker. And we're moving on here to uh, our third speaker in our setup. And I'm so happy to uh, welcome Pedro Clevati, who is head of growth at growthhackers.com and growth software. And uh, hi there, uh, Pedro. How are you? Hey, Jacob. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're so happy to have you with us. And um, I know you typically or normally live in San Francisco area or the Bay Area, but now you're in Brazil, aren't you? Yeah, I'm currently in Brazil. We are running a project with like the largest banking company from South America, and I'm responsible for running a few workshops. Uh, so I'm having uh, the pleasure to spend some time here in South America. Well, we're so happy that you could take time out of your busy schedule there and join us from Brazil and uh, talk about strategic and cultural foundations of growth. And you know, we're so stoked to hear this from you. So. 
the stage is yours. Thank you so much. If the mission to give this talk in 15 minutes wasn't hard enough, I'm now getting on stage after Randy, which is definitely not in his mission. But yeah, I will try to keep it short and straightforward uh, and leave some time for us to for Q&A at the end. And so just a few words about myself. I know that we don't have uh, much time, but I'm currently the head of growth at growthhackers.com. So our company was founded by Sean Ellis. He's the guy who coined the term growth hacking, wrote the book, Hacking Growth, was responsible for Dropbox, Success Case, and a few other uh, 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 mantras for, for the growth, uh, growth hacking world. So when I say that I'm head of growth at Growth Hackers, people will think like, hey, it's a matter growth or growth section of some kind. He must know everything. But at the end of the day, what that means is that I'm responsible for managing the experimentation and testing uh, uh, processes across all of our brand's assets. So that means that our growth software, the platform for managing growth processes, Growth University, our online uh, platform for to, to learn more about growth, a growth conference, which, by the way, is coming up uh, a couple of weeks from now on October 17th, completely online. You guys are all welcome to join. I believe Right Visions will provide you guys with a coupon, a discount coupon afterwards. But enough about myself. I want to, uh, the reason why I wanted to bring this subject about beyond hacks is because when companies are thinking or planning to implement a growth hacking processes, a growth hacking process, the first thing that comes to mind is usually the testing itself, the experiment, the A-B test, the hypothesis, the validation that they are aiming for. But for a successful, like for, for your growth program to actually be successful, there are a few other things that needs to be in place before you actually get down to the floor and start testing things. You are absolutely right. Uh, to assume that testing and experimentation is the process itself. And it is, right? But before getting down to actually running the process, I would, I would try to make sure that a few other pieces of the puzzle are in place. The bottlenecks are usually on those two first pillars. If we consider like a, a, a successful growth strategy or a successful growth program, what do they have in common? They have a company culture that embraces growth. They have a clear stra growth strategy in place. Their operation is in place and then they scale that up. So when I talk about a growth culture, what do I mean by that? And reminding you, uh, reminding you guys that like, so we are responsible for implementing like over 300 different growth programs across uh, companies from all sizes, all industries, uh, in different like maturity stages, right? And usually the biggest bottleneck is not on the team itself, is not on the, on, on the process, or is not on the people of the team. It doesn't matter how brilliant, how smart your growth team is. If your company is not like culture, culturally oriented towards growth and you don't have a clear strategy that everyone understands, the chances are your growth program is not going to achieve its maximum potential. So how do I certify and what do I mean by the cultural pillar? So first of all is the understanding about what is growth. So if the growth team has a different understanding of what the marketing team sees as grow, uh, growth hacking and the C-level and the directors and the VPs and everyone in the hierarchy uh, clearly uh, uh, is on the same page about what growth actually means, chances are at some point down the road, someone is going to get like, you're, you're, you're not going to satisfy everyone who is involved. So when we come in to implement a growth process, the first thing that we do that's the first thing that we do is actually gather all the decision makers, the important stakeholders, the key stakeholders of the company into the same room and run a workshop to make sure that everyone clearly understands what is growth. So what do I mean by clearly understanding what is growth? Companies are usually like used to manage their operations, which is usually planned upon historical data, forecasts. They have their playbooks. They have their sales scripts. They have their ACP, ICP. They have SLL, uh, SLL between departments. So everything is kind of mapped. And when we talk about growth, it's that uncertainty. It's that, uh, that like things that we are trying to validate, to optimize, uh, 
So it's a completely different way to manage them. Like if you're looking at your operations, you're managing towards like effectiveness. And we're in, when you're talking about growth, we're talking about experimentation, validation, optimization. So those are two completely different business, uh, d- 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 different ways to manage uh, to manage those areas. And also the expectations upon the, those should be in place as well. So a growth team will take a lot of more risks than an operation like a marketing, sales, and product team will normally take on our day-to-day uh, on their day-to-day operations. And what do I mean by risk taking? Like, let's take a, 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 the, the, probably the most successful growth operations that I'm aware of: Airbnb, Booking, Facebook, Amazon. So those are all big companies that like have this growth mindset and experimentation framework embedded in their DNA. And what kind of like the, the, the actually the failure rate of their experiments can go up to 80%. So that means that 80% of the experiments that they are running are actually not working as they previously uh, thought that, that it would or the hypothesis would uh, dictate. So does that mean that 80% of the entire growth program actually fails? No, it means that the failure is simply part of the process. Some experiments will not work, but the ones that work usually make up not only for the ones that didn't work, but takes you beyond where you were. So what like... Uh, when we talk about like growth process, like the, the probably the metric that has the higher correlation with your success is the number of experiments that you're running. The best guarantee that you have that you're going to find the answer to the question that you're looking for is the process itself, are the experiments that you're running. So making sure that everyone clearly understands those key differences between operations and a growth process failure is part of the process, you are going to have to take risks, and the incentives are going to have to be all aligned for that growth, uh, for that growth initiative to succeed. And one last tip about that, like the best way that we have found to actually influence growth uh, 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 from the, the cultural point of view is to try running that workshop, bringing real examples into the table and getting everyone involved into the growth operation. Regardless if they are actually event- eventually going to run an experiment or not, having everyone on the same page with a clear understanding about what growth actually means for that company and what you want to achieve throughout your growth process, right? So that's the first thing. The second pillar that I mentioned is the strategic pillar. So I know that when like you get up, uh, you get the approval to actually run a growth, a, a growth initiative. The first thing that we look at is, hey, I'm going to start running experiments. I'm going to run like tests all over the place. I would advise you to take a deep breath. And before actually running the experiment, make sure that you have a strategy in place. Usually, the way that we recommend you to build a strategy is through a three-layer cadence of KPIs. Those are the, like the, those KPIs are the North Star metric, which guarantees it's kind of complementary to your OKRs. So it looks at the growth uh, initiative from a product point of view. I'm not going to go too deep into the theory of North Star metrics since we are not going to have the time, but. The metric, it's like, it's called, they have different names nowadays, like the one metric that matters, obsession metrics, North Star metric. It doesn't matter how you call it, but it would definitely set up a North Star metric. And then you break that down into objectives, objectives and KPIs. So this is a, is actually what measures success for a growth team. I would try to build a strategy in which I have an one objective for acquisition, one for activation, one for retention, revenue, and referral. Each of those with a clear KPI that defines if I have achieved success, if I have achieved my goal or not, right? And the last layer on that three-layer cadence are your ideas, the experiments, the tests themselves. So ideas, experiments, and tests are going to help you achieve your objective. If you achieve your objective, you're going to be improving your North Star metric. So it's a three structure of uh, a three layer cadence of KPIs in a three structure uh, that composes your 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 strategy, uh, your, strat- your 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 growth strategy, right? Every single metric 
actually has a, 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 a component behind it. North Star metric is going to guarantee that you have company, company alignment. Objectives is going to guarantee that you have departments alignment. Ideas and experiments and tests are going to guarantee, is, go, is going to guarantee that everyone else in the company is actually involved and has a voice to suggest you a growth idea. So they all have a different purpose. And they're going to guarantee that everything that you do inside your growth environment is actually well aligned with where the company is heading or what the company expects from you, right? By doing that, you're going to get everyone in the company involved. That doesn't mean that everyone is going to be running experiments, but it does mean that everyone is involved in understanding and valuing, valuing what growth is actually delivering to the company. One last thing that I would say about the growth strategy is that respect, do the right thing at the right time. So if, in, if, if you're in the early days of actually launching your startup, your growth strategy should be oriented towards finding product market fit. Once you find your product market fit, once you find the niche that are going to get you rich, then it, it moves you to the second stage in a growth journey, which is a scale and traction phase. So by that phase, you already know what your persona, your ideal customer profile is, what niche you're, you're targeting, and you're going to run as many experiments as you can to gain as many as much market share as you can on that niche right so you're scaling and gaining traction towards that direction that you have defined in the previous stage once you achieve like once you go through the scale and traction phase that leads you to the last uh, uh, uh the last stage or maturity stage uh in this strategy wise which is the expansion in innovation by there once you get there the growth strategy will be oriented towards expanding into new markets, entering new categories, launching new products, buying new companies, growth as M&As, and so on, so on. So the last word about this is, so to, 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 to sum all of this up, build a growth strategy involving everyone in the company, use the three-layer cadence of KPIs to build that, and respect the time that your company is at. So product market fit, scale and traction, and then expansion, right? So we cover the cultural side of things. We cover the strategic side of things. The next one would be the operational pillar. So in operational pillar, it involves everything from the process itself, which is quite straightforward if we think about it, ideation, prioritization, testing, and analysis. It's a never-ending growth loop that you're going to ideate, prioritize, test, and analysis. That's the same of the framework. Second, second thing that I would think about is the people. So uh, there are different ways for you to structure a growth team. It can be an independent team. It can be a cross-functional team. It can be a mixed structure team. It can be an outsourced team. Uh, to find out what the best structure for your company is, you're going to have to think about a few other elements, like what do, we expect, what do I expect from my growth strategy? How many resources do I have at my disposal? Uh, what is it like in terms of timeline? How many, uh, how, how many time left do I have left to actually implement this? Uh, there is no right or wrong in terms of team structure. Uh, most of the companies that we started working with, they didn't have an independent team at first, but it evolved to the point where they became an independent team, right? Uh, so we talked about processes, we talked about people. The other thing that I would mention is data. So data needs to be accessible and trusted by everyone. So that doesn't mean that you need to get out of this talk and start hiring a data science. Like, great if you already have a data science in your team, but it's not mandatory for you to operate a, a growth process. What I would recommend is at least installing a few, like setting up a few data behavioral tools like Amplitude, Mix Panel, Kismetrics, Firebase, whatever that is, just so you can start capturing and trusting the data that it's coming in. It doesn't matter if you run like 100 experiments and by the end of the day, people don't actually trust the data that you're bringing to the table, right? Tools and resources go into the same bucket. So we have gone through the cultural side of things, the strategic side of things, the operational side of things. Once you've got all of those vectors uh, uh, in, into the same direction, that leads us to the last stage, which is scaling that up. So I usually separate like growth into three main boxes. 
Growth can be used for optimization, optimization purposes. So on that end, you're probably going to be running A-B tests on the front end, trying to optimize any specific channel, the conversion rate of a landing page or a cart. The second one is validation. So I'm trying to validate a new acquisition channel, a new retention model, a new pricing, uh, uh, a new pricing uh, proposal. And the last one, the last bucket would be the innovation. So I'm using growth as a methodology for me to decide if I should invest into a new product, a new category, a new market, and so on. So start out by defining what you expect from the growth team, which of those three buckets you're going to be focusing on uh, initially. Then standardize the process as much as you can. It's impossible to scale if uh, growth is simply that chaos um, across all uh, across uh, the entire company, right? So if everyone is using the same tools, following the same step-by-step -step processes, reporting, to the same, reporting it in the same way, respecting the same KPI, that means that you have a standard growth process and you're probably ready to scale. The last thing that I would mention in terms of scale is that growth is all about, like a growth is a process, it's not a project, meaning it doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's an ongoing and never-ending process of experimentation. Once you reach your objective, you move to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. A company never runs out of things to optimize or to validate or to innovate. By the way, if you don't do that, chances are you're going to be left behind. Right? I like that reminds me of Amazon headquarters. It's called actually day one. And that's a constant reminder for every employee that they need to innovate, validate, and optimize every day. The day that they come to the office and think that everyone that everything's already won, that's the day that they lost, right? And if you do the all of that, uh, if you do all of that, like the cultural, the strategic, the operation, the scale, that's gonna lead you to become a learning driven organization. So that means that the process of learning new things, it's embedded into the process itself. It's not like a training session or an HR department session. That's actually something that you do as a process. It's part of your day-to-day -day operation, right? So to wrap all of this up, like I'm gonna invite everyone to who wants to find out, like, all right, where am I at? Do I have all of that already? Or where should I go? I would invite or recommend you guys to check out the growth maturity test. So it's a quick survey, like five minute survey that are gonna rank you among five different growth levers. And aside from that, you're also gonna receive an action, a suggestion of an action plan to, for you, to take you to the next level. So that's a great way for you to figure out kind of like where your company is at in terms of growth. You might be a super growth professional that knows everything, but the company is not there yet. So you're gonna evaluate you across all of those four different pillars that I just mentioned. It's cultural, strategic, uh, operational, and scale as well. So that's completely free. Uh, just spending some time here for you guys to have a chance to, to, to scan this QR code. But yeah, uh, it has been a pleasure. I know that I crossed the 15 minutes line, but I'm gonna leave my contacts here if you guys wanna reach out to keep this conversation going or any other question that you would like to ask. Happy to help. <laughs> Thank you, Pedro. Really, really good and inspiring insights you provided us with. And I'm I'm in uh, middle of your uh, growth survey here, you know. Well, let's see what awesome. comes up with. <laughs> so yeah, it looks, awesome. looks really good. Nice work there. And uh, yeah, we have uh, a few minutes for uh, Q&A here. So Anna, what do we have for Pedro? Yeah, so we have a brilliant question to start with. So uh, Ellis is asking, while the focus is on the strategy and culture, are there still any tools or hacks that you will recommend anyway? Yeah, uh, so I guess like for companies that are already operating, meaning running experiments, like a uh, reasonable amount of experiments, five up to 10 or more, uh, I would recommend you to check out Growth Software, Growth.Software, which is a growth management platform. So it's kind of like a project management tool, but built and designed precisely for that purpose of experimentation. That's the first one that I would check out. Uh, in terms of like uh, data, I always incentivize companies to check out like behavioral data tools because they always have a free tier like Amplitude, Mixed Panel, Keys Matrix, uh, Firebase for, for mobile apps. All of them are either free or they have a free tier. So I'm not saying that you do need to pay for that right away, but install it, 
map out uh, your, your, your data, your inputs, and simply make sure that you, you, you trust the data that is coming in, right? Even if you're not going to use that right now, you're at least be, building the foundation for that. Uh, those are the two kinds and like Google optimize is some setting, but AB, AB testing tools, like I'm not, I'm kind of an agnostic between, <laughs> in terms of like AB testing tools. So whatever helps you run as many experiments as you can independently from the rest of the company structure. Meaning if I don't have to go through my product team's uh, uh, board to get something done, if I can do it by myself, Everything on that is helpful. So I would try to optimize for the number of experiments that you run as opposed to the complexity of the experiments or anything like that. Another question from the audience is how can teams maintain a growth focused culture while navigating challenges or setbacks? So I do believe uh, it's uh, what all marketers would like to know from you at this stage. Yeah. So I, I would say that like the first thing is to separate those both in the, those those two environments, right? Like marketing, sales, product teams, they have their day-to-day -day operation. So you already know what you have to do in terms of that. Like I do need to produce X amount of content. I'm gonna send my newsletter, I have my event, I'm gonna I have my paid media campaigns going on. Like all of that is things that you already know that you have to do, and you can kind of forecast the results that they're gonna bring, right? Like I have done that in the past. This is kind of like where that uh, the, the results that that bought us. So I kind of know what to expect. Everything else that you are not sure how they're going to play out. If you should actually invest time or resources or money or people on that initiative, or it's uncertainty, you don't have historical data, then you put that on the growth bucket. So the way to actually like face or maintain a growth folks culture is first of all, separating those both environments. Like this is something that you cannot uh, 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 fail in 80% of the things that you do. Operationally wise, you're probably like, you do have a tolerance for, for failure, but it's not that high. On that other environment, those are the big bets that you're placing, right? Things that are like, if it doesn't work, you know how bad it can go. But if it does work, is what makes like 100x, 200x difference on your pipeline and can definitely change the, the, the course of things. So I would start thinking that way. And one like underrated is skill set and underrated activity when we talk about growth and mainly related to maintaining a growth focus, uh, maintaining a culture a growth oriented culture is actually to cheer leader as much as you can. Like growth, growth professionals usually live on a bubble. Like we know a lot of tools, we know a lot of hacks, we said a lot of things, we got a lot of parallels and stuff, but that's only like, the only people that are aware of that are the other growth prof professionals in my team. So cheer leader, what ha whatever is happening inside the growth environment as much as you can to the rest of the company. The experiments that worked, the people who suggested you ideas, the things that you validated, the things that you learned along the way, promote that as, may, as much as you can to the rest of the company. That only will give you, like, you're going to be gathering more uh, 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 promoters to the growth initiatives. You're going to have a richer, a richer backlog of ideas for you to test. You're going to have different points of view coming from every department uh, uh, to you. So it's a win-win-win situation. And it's usually like under undervalued uh, skill, but I would highly recommend you to do that. You are talking about the skill set. So can you tell us all what would you say is the growth hacker starter pack uh, in, uh, in your understanding? <laughs> That's a great one. So I would say that like curiosity might be one of the skill sets that I would like if I was hiring for a growth professional, that's probably the first thing. You do need to be curious about everything because you're going to be trained like things that you might have never done before. You don't know how to work. You don't know how to expect. So uh, having fun doing that is probably one of the things that I would uh, I, 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 I would search in a professional. Uh, the second one is like being comfortable when you are wrong. Again, the most successful growth teams that I'm aware of, they have an up to 80% failure rate. So if you're going to suffer in every experiment that don't work, 
that's definitely not the game for you. <laughs> so like I always bring the example of like Amazon's uh, homepage, like for every, uh, for every designer that I have ever asked, hey, or, or UX or UI, hey, how do you feel about Amazon's like homepage? Is it beautiful? Like, do you like it? Like, how, how do you feel about it? And everyone says that it's horrible and it doesn't, it's not like, uh, uh, visually satisfying, etc. Th and then I ask you, like, does Amazon actually needs, like, it lacks the resources to do a completely different homepage? It doesn't lack those resources. The homepage looks like it is because it works. It works. It converts. It has a three, like, I, I think it's a three X uh, above the average conversion rate for lending for 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 e-commerces in the market. So that means that it works. So the second skill that I would say it's like just simply being comfortable with like w whenever your process fail. Uh, so yeah, curiosity, being comfortable with that, and also like another uh, probably underrated skill set is knowing how to navigate company bureaucracies and politics. So knowing who to go after, who you can get in your side to get something approved, promoting your wins and losses to everyone, and simply knowing how to drive that. One of the mantras for growth is like, like breaking down the silos, letting the information flow across departments, and so on. For that to happen, you do need to be like kind of a politic and knowing exactly like how to do that, how to navigate company bureaucracy. It's also one that I would highlight. Amazing. Thank you so much for this. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much, you guys, for yeah. having me. I hope you guys like it. And yeah, uh, there are my contacts if anyone wants to reach out and keep this conversation going. Thanks again, Emma. Sure uh, thank you so much, uh, Pedro. It was awesome and uh, really, really interesting. And I hope to, you know, follow more of your content at Growth Hackers and so forth. So, and uh, be sure to check out your event coming up in October here. So yeah, thank you so much. And good luck now in Brazil with all your uh, workshops down there. <laughs> thank you guys. Thanks for, for having me. Have a great one. You too. Okay. And now we're going into the next speaker here and our last speaker for today, who is uh, Mats Vederkop, who is CEO of Dream Influence but also an expert in scaling SaaS businesses and have done several journeys where he have started out or started with a very small company and scale it up to uh, a bigger company and have done that journey over many times. And now you're in your third endeavor here at least. And uh, we're so happy to have you with us. Uh, welcome, Mats. Thank you very much. It's a yeah, and you're here. based in Copenhagen, so a little bit closer this time. Yeah, that's very true. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's and we're stoked to hear about your insights about, you know, how to do this uh, growth and scaling that you have done now many times. So, yeah, take it away and we'll take the questions afterwards. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for showing up today. Really looking forward to this one. So I have plenty of slides and I only have 15 minutes, so this is going to be fast. Um, I'm happy to share the slides afterwards, um, but try seeing if you can follow and uh, obviously uh, ask questions for, for the Q&A session. Okay, let's get started. So we're going to talk profit-focused growth and how to scale your revenue beyond client acquisition. So before we start, a bit about me. Nice introduction right there. Um, CEO of Dream Influence right now, partner at Blazer Capital who owns Dream. Uh, I founded and was CEO at Quake Order for nearly seven years, which I took that to 7 million ARR, 70 plus employees, did two mergers and acquisitions during my time there. I'm the chairman of Morning Score, which is an SEO tool, and I'm on the board of directors at Wake Up Data, which is a data feed management tool, all SaaS companies. So I'm all about SaaS, been in SaaS for around a decade now. Okay, so what really drives growth? Customers, sales, marketing, commercial activities, right? We just heard about growth hacking. Yeah. So. Let's imagine that we have a SaaS company, imaginary SaaS company. Let's call it Rocket Fuel. Rocket Fuel provides an excellent sales enablement tool that helps client grow their revenue. Customers pay upfront. The price point is $200,000 per year. Contracts include a 20% upgrade year over year for the first three years. And the first year, uh, Rocket Fuel closes 10 contracts um, and hits $2 million uh, ARR. Um, so 
rocket fuel continues to grow at $2 million per year. So this is not right. It's the eventual perpetual machine of SaaS. We close 2 million, we, those renew, we close another two, another two, and they also renew. So we continue growing. That's nice, right? It's acquisition, it's customers, it's marketing, it's growth, it's great. And what if we decided to invest even more money? Then we could continue growing even faster. So we hire more sales rep, we grow even faster. Now we have a not something that looks like an exponential growth line here. So the typical SaaS case, we start by growing, we procure even more money into growth. We might use some of that upfront, upfront money we got from the clients the first year to hire even more sales rep, do even more marketing, do events like these, and then we grow and grow and grow and grow. It's amazing. And we can even throw expansions in there. So those customers we closed the first year, they might upgrade the second year and they might upgrade even more the third year. So now we start to really see exponentiality, right? New customers, that's what's driving it. Well, on the surface level, it is. So this is actually anonymized data, but it's data from a real SaaS case. Um, let's imagine it's uh, it's Rocket Fuel's data. So Rocket Fuel did a traditional triple, 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 double, double. That's great. It's just by the book. And if we look at acquisitions, it's driven by acquisitions. It's all about new clients. We, we, we're growing at insane paces by buying new clients. It's great. And probably at this point, the CEO hires a VP of sales because that's what we do, right? We have a VP of sales. He double, he triples the business. It's the CEO's new best friend. Then there's a bit of a slump. That VP is fired. Now we hire another one and another one. And it's a typical playbook. But what happens when I plot all of these numbers into a graph? This. So where the real exponentiality actually lies is your existing clients. It's renewing clients. This line, the blue line. It's And renewing clients is a privilege that has to be earned. It's not something that we just do by magic. Yeah, we might sign them to a contract, but that contract needs to renew someday. So it's really about retention. It's about maximizing value of what you've already got. Sure, in the very early days, you can drive crazy growth numbers by just acquiring and acquiring and acquiring and buying clients. But if you take a bit of a longer lens, which is really important these days where efficient growth has become the name of the game and no longer uh, growth at all cost, then it's all about retention. It's all about your existing clients. And this graph makes it very apparent. So that's all good. Now, what have I done at Dream Influence and how did the mindset about existing clients and maximizing the potential of an existing customer base helped me create a tremendous shift in growth in Dream Influence. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive in to my first 12 months as CEO. And I joined in July last year. Um, and we're going to look at the time frame from July until June 2023. Okay, so when I joined, let's get a few metrics straight. We were at 10% monthly churn, horrendous. Um, the ARPA was around 260 euros, so average revenue per account, for those that might not know. Everybody might not be SaaS people here. Then the monthly recurring revenue, so our subscription revenue, was at 28k euros. So we were in, basically invoicing 28k euros per month when I was joining, um, and 2.8k of those would go out of out of business uh, or leave our business um, end, of, end of that month when I joined. And then our lifetime value was roughly um, uh, 3K euros at that point. Mm -hmm. So the immediate fix and the immediate issue I had to do was fixing churn. Again, back to retention, back to renewing contracts. So churn was the first thing I dove into. First thing first, a quick tip for all of you and what, and what you shouldn't do, you shouldn't lose the, the obvious thing to do here would be to look at all of the churns, look at the reasons, and then try to find out what, what's going on, why, why are these clients churning? But I flipped it upside down. So instead of looking at why are the customers churning that are churning, I looked at what does the clients that are staying in the business actually have in common? And I was looking for that aha moment that we were giving the clients um, and, and trying to figure out what that was exactly. So, 
then when I found out uh, our aha moment was when clients stay, clients stayed six months plus, and they were working with the same influencers over and over again, we could see a spike in conversions and engagement rate and reach and, and everything. So it took time and we had to keep clients in for half a year. Now I compared those successful clients with the churn clients. So now I went in and looked at the churn clients after I knew what was actually creating the success of those clients in the client base that wasn't churning. So it turned out that the reason they were churning was because they, they didn't give it enough time. They were giving up too early. They were giving up before that half a year. And kind of looking at the, um, looking at the results after one campaign or just a couple of months. So we adjusted the offering. And I, the first thing I did, and I did it in July, right as I joined, we introduced contracts with minimum commitment of six months. And what that did is churn failed. The first cohort has been renewed now, a um, couple of months ago, um, half a year ago. Uh, and churn on that cohort was only 4%. So that was amazing. We, we reduced churn from plus 10% to 4% just by introducing this. And yeah, it did make it so that we didn't close as many new clients, but we closed the right clients. We closed the clients that was actually interested and committed to trying out this six months period that is needed in order to get success with our products. So obviously that won't do it itself. So after I fixed that and kind of had to wait to see what is that going to do for the business after six months, I started to look at the price point because the price point needed to fit the successful clients or ICPs needed to be identified. Because one thing is getting clients in the business, but you're attracting different kinds of clients with different kinds of price points. And what I found out was that our price point was way too low compared to who had actually had the success on the platform. They were, would be able to pay way more. And they even had a negative sentiment about our very low price. They initially, when they joined us, they were like, mm, is this too good to be true? Can can we really get the value for that such, such a low price? So pricing was, was a really important next step for me. So I raised pricing every second month for six months in a row. So prices just kept and kept going up and up and up and up. And one third of our sales calls needs to experience pushback on pricing before we are on the sweet spot. That's kind of a saying we have internally um, and something that we've used every time we raise prices. We ra raised prices, we waited for two months. If there were no pushback, we kept raising them. Um, currently, we are at a price point that starts to make sense. Um, we are not entirely at one third, but we are reluctant to raise it even more right now. We're waiting for the product to improve a bit more before we raise it again. Um, and we also just raised it in August. So, so we'll probably wait a bit more. Now we can't keep up the pace with raising the price every, every second month anymore. We'll have to, to, to up that cadence a bit, but I, I firmly believe that we can still raise prices even further. So the third thing. I then did was a bit more long term. So these these first two things, contracts pricing, that's very immediate. It's straight to to the point. It's immediate effect. But the next thing I did was that I he heavily invested in our product because I know from experience that if you want to retain those clients and if you want to keep growing with your clients and actually earn more money on your existing client base, you need a killer product. So I added proven people. I added people that I've either taken the journey with myself before or that had taken that journey somewhere else. So I hired my former CTO from Quake Order. I hired a freelancer that I worked with in Quake Order as design director. I hired uh, a data scientist I worked with in Quake Order. And I hired a full stack developer, which I worked with in Quake Order. And I brought all of those very senior, very experienced people in straight away. And that was a huge investment. Remember, we were only just above 25K monthly recurring revenue at this point. These guys alone costs in euros, that's uh, 10, 10, 10, that's 30, that's roughly 35K euros combined. So they alone were eating more than we were uh, having in revenue every month. Um, but because I introduced these six months contracts and we were forcing people to pay those up front, we could leverage um, a very low payback time on those sales and then use that upfront money to actually pay salaries. 
but it was bad. So the results, just to summarize them um, from all of these things, these things that I've done. So churn ran from plus 10% to less than 4% day of today. So we are sub 4% now, we are approaching 2%. Average revenue per client ran from 260 euros to 433 euros. So 66.5% growth on the existing client base. Lifetime value ran from 3,000 euros to 11,150 euros. 270% growth in lifetime value on our clients. That's massive, by the way, because that allows us to invest more money in buying clients. So the results uh, further, total amount of customers when I started was 113. In June this year, we were only at 150. So we only grew the client base 32%. Meanwhile, we grew the business more than 166% in total. So it came from a more relevant existing client base that we grew with. ARR growth, 120% in this period. So the most important learning here for all of you to take away today is on surface level, growth comes from new sales and new clients. But in reality, it's all about your existing clients and lifetime value. So that was a lot of lights. It was a lot of information in a short amount of time, but I'm very that there's probably plenty of questions. Um, so let's jump to those now. Thank you, Matt. Really interesting and such a journey you have done over the last year. Fantastic. And thanks for sharing those learnings with us. Okay. And it's totally uh, so relevant for most companies, I would say. So Anna, take it away on the question side here. The chat is absolutely crazy with asking questions, Mas. But uh, let us ask you one from the team, actually, from, from, from us here. Uh, how do you uh, get a business buy-in when you come to the board or um, you come to the VC and say, like, listen, guys, we will have the results better than yep. you can imagine, but not tomorrow, but 12 months down the line? Yeah, so um, one good saying is uh, under-promise, over-perform. If you start by doing that, um, then you kind of gain your board's or your investor's trust. Um, and then if you're on top of that, build with data. Um, so you kind of show, all right, we overperformed on what I promised. Now, if we just forecast what we're doing right now, then we will be at this point 12 months out in time. So it would be a good idea to make this investment. That's usually the approach I take. Um, it's you I could do a whole speak about that um but but that that's the short version the next one is how would you measure customer long time value yeah so um customer lifetime value um so there's multiple ways of going about this uh but but the easiest way uh if you're very early and you don't have like years and years of data and a lot of cohorts to look into um, which was the case with Dream when I started, is to take the year or two of data that you have, look at your churn rate, um, average it out. So look at your past four months churn rate, average that out. And then what you basically do is you take one and you divide it by your churn rate. Because what you get then is a lifetime rate. It, it's a function of if you stop doing anything today, you stop selling, how many months would it take before you ran out of clients? Now you take that lifetime rate and you, you kind of, you, you multiply that by your average revenue per account. So if you on average are charging, let's say a thousand bucks per month and your lifetime rate is a hundred months, well, then you have a hundred times a thousand, a uh, hundred thousand uh, in lifetime value. And could you share some key metrics other than the NDR that you yep. track yep. for customer profitability? Yeah. So. NDR is obviously a good North Star, but um, what, what we look at, at a lot right now is uh, custom acquisition cost recovery. So pay or CAC payback, um, it's the same thing. But basically, we look at a fully weighted custom acquisition cost. So that includes 
salaries, commissions, uh, any partners that needs to, to have a commission, all marketing costs um, and all costs for software related to, to the sales and marketing organization. And then you have a monthly cost, you divide it by the amount of clients you have and you have your CAC. So then when we look at our CAC, we look at, okay, how much are the clients again paying on a monthly basis on average? So say we have a CAC of $5,000 and we have a monthly a fee on average of $1,000, then our payback period before we start even earning money on that client is five months. Um, so th that's obviously really relevant because then we know when are we starting to have a positive return on this client and that needs to balance with your cash flow. Um, in Dream Influence, when I joined, our CAC payback was around 10 months. Now it's down to 2.7. And that's without uh, taking into consideration that we are getting um the money up front so if we were taking that into consideration because it's down to 2.7 we are actually earning 3.3 months um of revenue like that and we can reinvest that into further growth so that's a really good efficiency metric to look at when you look at your customers profitability uh there is another one which uh, sounds extremely interesting. Uh, how do you balance between maximizing revenue from existing clients and not at the same time overwhelming them with upsells and yeah. cross sales? Yeah. yeah. Um, so that, that is a really good question. Um, I'll, I'll split it, split my answer into two. I'll tell you what we do today. Um, and then I will tell you how I'd like to do it um, and how I did it in quick order, which is more of the world's rise. It's a bit more of an expensive place to get to, but it's a better place to get to do. So how we do today in Dream is basically we take a very personalized approach because we only have roughly 150 clients. Um, we kind of somebody in the business knows them on a personal level. Um, so so we we have a really really good feeling, and because it's still early days, we have that very good feeling with each client. We know where they are, if they're satisfied, if they're having problems, um, and then we we take this personal approach. So. When we raise prices, um, we don't necessarily um, just bump every client up to that price. Uh, we we handpick the clients that we know will accept that we now raise prices. So in the next invoice, it, it will be more expensive. Um, and then on those that are not ready for that, we work harder on making those clients successful so that the next time we raise prices, then we, we might go, all right, we raise prices again. We know that's two price price increases since you signed. We won't bump you up to the new prices, but we'll have to bump you up to the prices that we didn't bump you up to before next time. So they actually feel they get a discount now. Um, and, and that way we kind of, we have some laggers in pricing, but they actually feel really well treated and they feel we reward their loyalty because they are getting a huge ass discount. In reality, they're just paying more. Um, so so that's, that's what we do today. It's very pragmatic. It's very hacky. Um, what we did in quick order and where we are starting to to kind of go with dream and preparing to go is using way more data for it um so actually starting to look at product usage uh tracking all events in the product looking and then looking have our data scientist build an algorithm he did the same thing in quick order that looks at okay those clients that naturally reaches out to us and wants to buy more because that also happens that they call us and say hey we want to buy more those clients how are they using the product? What, what is it? The algorithm kind of looks into what, what is it they do? What are the signs of success? And then on the other hand, you can use that for churn mitigation too. So you can also see who is very much not likely to operate in right now and who is actually in the risk of churning. And when you have that data, you can start to automate it. You can start to nudge them through notifications, through mail flows, um, through really well-timed calls from their customer success manager or their account manager, depending on your setup. By the way, I don't recommend using customer success managers for it. A uh, bit of a contrarian uh, look at it, but customer success managers are building success for the client and relationship with the client. And if they are to start to talk about contracts and money, you are throwing a wrench in the reel on that on that rela relationship. So I'd always prefer to have the account executive or, or if you have an account management style, have the account manager um, take that dialogue. Um, so, so that's just a, a little uh, input to that. But use data, track inputs, track, find your prognostar. So for us, we found out it was those six months and a certain amount of, 
of campaigns and a certain amount of usage on, on influencers and reusage of content. So we have four KPIs we can measure on. But to to make it may, maybe give a an example that people know even better or, or can relate to better, Slack. Everybody knows Slack. Slack found out that if if their free trials, if they were sending too fast messages, there were no way they were leaving and they would be upgrading to a pro because they maximized their value and they were now so filtered into Slack that they would just be staying. Um, so, so find that product KPI. And when your clients hit it, you know you can attack them and, and get more money out of them. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, we have the last one. Yep. Um, so what would be your biggest tip that you would give to companies who are heavily focused on client acquisition and uh, missing out on leveraging these existing relationships? Yeah. Um, so that's a really, really good question because obviously it's always a balance. And it's not like we are not focused on getting new clients. We also doing a lot of activities to do that. Um, but it often starts from the top in the company. And depending on the size, if you have a CFO, um, it's often actually at the CFO's table that it starts uh, because the board uh, gets to the CEO, says, all right, um, double next year. Okay, that's fine. And then the CFO looks at the um, at the budget. And when you look at budgets, uh, things like customer success, customer support, product, that's all just cost. It's a cost center. It's not revenue driving. Um, and then he looks at, okay, how many MQLs did we create last year? How many SQLs did that create? How much do we convert those SQLs? Okay, that's look, that, that looks great. We did 5 million last year on that. Now, in order to do 10, I just have to double the marketing budget so that we can get twice the MQLs, so that we get twice the SQLs, so that we get twice the clients, and then everybody's happy, right? No, that's not how it works. Um, but that's how a CFO thinks. Uh, and in many cases, that's where it comes from. So um, MQLs in general is a thing of, the zeros where um, you didn't have tools like Apollo and you didn't have tools like Cognizant and Zoom Info and so on. So the only way to get contact info was MQLs. So in order for sales to have somebody to call, you needed to get that information yourself. That's readily available to that. You don't need to annoy people with eBooks and webinars and so on to, to get emails to do that. No, it's about providing value. It's about creating, creating events like these where you provide free value. And then from that, you create demand and then you capture demand later down. But the CFO doesn't see that. So he, he will just push on to acquire more clients. And it's really changing that mindset in the very upper layer of the company at first. If, if, that does, if, it's, if there's no buy-in from it, from very top level management, then it's not going to happen. They will continue focusing on acquiring new clients. That's just how it is. When it changes there, then you have the next battle. Now it's time to battle with the VP sales. Because VP sales is all about acquiring new clients and he gets his uh, on target earning, which is often double his base salary based on his annual quota, which is the team's quota. And now you may be starting to, if, if you change the mindset to more demand gen, demand capture, then you're probably also starting to collaborate more across the departments on clients. You probably there will, there will be a natural gravitation towards clients rather, rather than silos that have each of their KPIs in the organization. So now the sales rep is starting to bitch about that client that upgraded automatically. Normally I would I would have to call that client in order for the client to upgrade. So am I getting my commission for that? No, you're not because the product did that. And now you have sales reps that are kind of on the fence. Oh, I, I used to get that commission. Now I have to get that commission in another way. And and that's, that's all friction that will come. Um, but if you manage to change the mindset and you manage to get sales on board with it and explain that, it's actually for the better good of the company. And there are still ways to get the commission. It's just about getting even more clients in, but from a different angle, then, then you are at a place where you find the right balance because then it becomes customer first rather than just more things down the funnel. And then in the end, they just churn out uh, and you just have a, basically you end up having what we have a lot of right now after the crisis, you, we have a lot of walking dead companies where they got tons and tons of funding and now it's just keep the lights on money. Um, and there's no way for them to fund again because they raised way too high valuations and they cannot uphold those valuations. Um, and that is because it was growth at all costs and it was the good old playbook with just pushing money down the funnel, having super aggressive sales reps and a super aggressive VP sales 
that was just again triple 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 double double it was all it was about for the past 10 years and that doesn't work anymore so you you actually have to change it if you want to survive in the future that was a bit of a rant but i hope it answered <laughs> <it. laughs> <clears throat> sorry it's an interesting round and uh yeah, thank you so much, Matt. That was really interesting to hear your take on those things. And, uh, okay. you know, I think uh, you have a really good uh, take on things like the customer success manager role, which we have talked about previously in, in other events here at Brightvision and so forth. So, yeah, thank you so much for sharing those insights and your experiences there. We're, thanks for uh, having me. You know, it was a great, great session. So thanks and good luck now with... Dream Influence and Thanks. all the Thanks. efforts uh, or, or things you're doing there. Thank you. And uh, for anybody in the audience, um, my name is on the screen now. Find me on LinkedIn if you want to connect. Uh, and if you have questions, I'm more than happy to answer them there. So uh, always happy to connect, always happy to, to pay it forward. So just reach out if you have anything you want inspiration on or want my take on. Thank you, Mads. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Awesome. And uh, right. There we are. So this is it for today. So just wanted to repeat if you have heard something here that you maybe would like to toss around or, or discuss with one of our growth experts here at Bright Vision. Click through the link here and uh, sign up for a free growth workshop where you can get a second opinion or just ask questions or ask for some advice, whatever part of the bow tie funnel you're targeting or feeling that you would like more um, input on or, or get best practice ideas around. Just reach out and we'd be happy to, to set up a meeting with you. Okay, and uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you for sticking around and listening to all our four speakers. And we sure hope you have learned a lot. And uh, I'm always surprised that even though we have done a lot of these things, it always comes up new angles, new ideas, new things to, to uh, learn from and hear from and so forth. So I, I really hope you have felt that as well. And uh, with that said, I hope also that you find our upcoming events in the future here. Uh, we typically do a few of these every year. So next in is in December. And we also have other webinars through targeted uh, subjects as well as the podcast, which uh, many of the speakers showing up here have, have showcased before and so forth. So with that, Anna, any last famous words from your side? That did sound a little bit threatening, uh, but thank you for being a wonderful audience, everybody. And we will send the recording to you shortly after. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Thank you, Anna. And thank you so much, everybody. Catch you later in other events. Have a great day now.